Here's a frightening fact. Right now on Australian roads, there are close to a million vehicles fitted with airbags that instead of saving lives, could kill. They're time bombs made by Takata, a company so greedy it willfully put profits above human safety. This saga started two decades ago when the company developed a new cheap airbag. Only problem, and Takata knew this, they were faulty, filled with a volatile chemical prone to explode without warning. And when they did, it caused deaths and horrific injuries. The Takata airbag scandal is now the biggest auto recall in the world. But as you'll see, Australia has been slower than many countries to take the decisive action needed to save lives. Inside this steering wheel is an airbag that is supposed to save your life. Five, four, three, two, But instead of inflating, one. it explodes. Looks like it failed catastrophically. Shards of metal tear a hole in the middle of the airbag, shooting meters out across the ground. See that piece of metal coming out? That's the, that's the type of thing that's killing people. Look at the size of it. It's the tragic reality for the driver when their airbag blows up instead of out. Basically, there's been a gunshot in the cabinet of the vehicle. Uh, this piece of shrapnel has come out through the airbag into the victim's eye. Through the front of the airbag? Yeah. There's been another highway death caused by a defective airbag. These ticking time bombs are in 100 million cars around the world. No one can predict when the next one will explode. So he just pulled her out of the car, and her neck is severed. But when they do, shards of metal fly into the face of drivers, maiming and sometimes killing. Went straight out of the airbag into his neck. A car accident like that shouldn't kill someone. So far, there's been 24 deaths and at least 300 injuries. It looked like something you would see out of a movie. I did not know if his eyeball was there or not. I said then and there that if we go forward with this, someone would be killed. And yet they chose to ignore you. Yes, that's right. Tonight, for the first time, the brave men who, nearly 20 years ago, blew the whistle on the airbag makers to Carter Corporation. I said, do you realize that you're creating a unit that's going to fail? Each man warned management about the potential for death, but every time their concerns were ignored. I said, trust me on this, it's going to come back and haunt you. And that was 17 odd years ago. That's, that's correct. And we ask why our government authorities didn't act sooner. Why did you sit on your hands? We did not sit on our hands. Are you aware of any issues or the Takata airbag recall? I have heard of it. It's a busy morning for the Northern Territory Police Major Crash Investigation Unit. Are you aware if your car's on the list? No, is it? These officers are alerting drivers that their cars have highly dangerous airbags. You aware of that? No. Detective Sergeant Mike Audelman is on the front line in this fight to get Takata airbags out of cars before they blow up. For Mike, this campaign is personal because last year he saw firsthand the injuries a 22-year-old woman suffered from an exploding Takata airbag after a minor car accident. Michael, as a seasoned crash investigator, how would you describe her injuries? Catastrophic. Not something you see every day? No, not, not from a crash that should have been a run-of-the-mill crash. Garden variety bingle. Yeah. For her, she should, what, have just walked away? Yes. Tragically, that didn't happen. The accident left the young woman blinded and brain damaged. You can see the nice rough match where it's... It's come out, come through, out, the, come out through the airbag. Through the bag. Yeah. These pieces of metal shrapnel are airbag remnants from the accident in the victim's Toyota RAV4 SUV in April last year. I'm just staggered by the size of that shrapnel. Well, what it is, it's pretty heavy. It's almost akin to an explosion in front of your face or a hand grenade. The young woman became the first Australian victim of a ruptured Takata airbag. Essentially, in this crash, this piece over here has been propelled through the young lady's eyeglasses. 
She's and wearing these at the time. Yes, she was wearing those at the time of the crash. Dear me, so that's straight in through her left eye. Yeah. And uh, from what the surgeons have told us, since this has struck the left part on the inside of the temple and then gone across the forebrain and ledge and lodged against the right side of her skull. That whole piece has come out of her? That whole piece was surgically removed from her brain. That's unbelievable. The Takata airbags are unique in that they contain the volatile and unstable chemical ammonium nitrate. It's in no other airbags. It's the unpredictability of this chemical that's the danger. You see, in an accident, it can cause an airbag to explode in what engineers describe as aggressive overdeployment. The end result is that instead of saving the driver's life, the airbag explosion can end up injuring or killing them. That's on the list. Let's put one on the window. On the other side of the world, in Houston, Texas, Scott and Eric Solis feel compelled to warn locals about the dangers of the Takata airbag. My brother passed away here in 2015 from a uh, defective Honda Takata airbag. After the product killed their brother, Carlos, in another low-speed bingle in his Honda Accord. All these makes right here have different models that are recalled. It breaks my heart knowing that Carlos is gone. What about someone else's Carlos, you know? Someone else's brother. Someone else's father. Someone else's everything. Having to die because of an airbag. Scott, where was your brother's car when you got here? Carlos's car is right here at the middle lane, waiting to turn in to this apartment complex. It happened at the front of Scott's apartment. He remembers racing to the car and cradling his brother, at the same time trying to stem the bleeding. And I'm puzzled because the vehicle doesn't look that damaged. And I just noticed the towel or jacket that we were using was just soaked, soaked in blood. Uh, yeah, at that point, I knew he, was, he wasn't with us anymore. What about when the police got here? They were dumbfounded. They were looking for a bullet hole. So the police were thinking somehow he must have been shot. They thought he was shot, or they thought maybe he was stabbed at a gas station before he got here. So they didn't even question the airbag at all. It took days before the Solis family were told the true reason for Carlos's death. Today, Scott still can't believe his brother was killed by the very thing that was supposed to save him. The police officer found what they pulled out of my brother, which was a round disc that weighed roughly a pound and a half to two pounds. What, sort of like a hockey puck? Like a hockey puck, exactly. So that came straight out of the airbag and hit him in the Went neck. straight out of the airbag into his neck and got lodged to, the back, to his left shoulder. So it just went straight through him. Happy birthday, dear Carla. Scott Solis and his family are among the hundreds whose lives have been scarred forever. Victims of one of the worst corporate scandals the world has ever seen, involving a massive cover-up stretching back two decades. It began when the Japanese-owned Takata Corporation started making low-cost airbags to get a jump on its competitors. Chemical engineer and explosives expert Mark Lilly was there in the late 1990s when the company made the fateful decision to use a chemical called ammonium nitrate. When you saw the words ammonium nitrate, alarm bells went off there. Absolutely, absolutely. Ammonium nitrate is not appropriate for a high-precision explosive, particularly for a high-precision explosive that needs to be stored for a long period of time. And I made, the, I made the prediction, I said then and there, that if we go forward with this, someone will be killed. We're in the United States at New Mexico Tech. Here in the desert, they run an outdoor, world-class explosives testing ground. What are we going to do with this? This is an airbag module as you would have in your car. Mark is going to replicate what happens when a faulty Takata airbag explodes. So, so this is a Takata airbag? This Mark. is a Takata airbag. Mark has been an explosives fanatic since he was a teenager, when he blew his fingers off in a failed explosion. But it didn't deter him. He went on to work for the US space shuttle program and the military, and then to Carter. Five, four, three, two, one. The explosion happens in 55 milliseconds. That's the same amount of time it takes to blink an eye 
or sneeze. Well, that looked like it was a catastrophic failure. Did you hear how loud that was? Watching the vision from the high-speed camera reveals multiple explosions and flying metal shards. It's like a small bomb going off at 300 kilometers an hour. Look at how that airbag just shredded. That flame. It just blew a hole in it a meter wide. Look, there's still shredding there's more, there's out. more pieces coming look, look. out. Yep. Now that is, that's deadly. That is a fatality right there because that's hitting you right in the face and the neck. Look, there's the, there's the bag there. Out on the explosives range, there's airbag fragments scattered everywhere. That's some force to move those, isn't it? Yes, yeah. To, to pull that assembly apart and do that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you saw what it did to the bag. That, that just popped it like a balloon. No wonder it's killing people. We knew 20 years ago that this was a problem. We warned them 20 years ago this was a problem. Back in 1999, when Takata first brought in ammonium nitrate, Mark knew immediately that the chemical degrades over five or six years and then becomes unstable. The trigger for this to happen is long-term temperature changes and increased moisture. In other words, hot, humid weather. How unstable is ammonium nitrate compared to other propellants? It is not appropriate to use for this type of, uh, this type of a propellant. Well, why did they choose it? Because it was cheap. It's the ultimate profit problem, isn't it? Yes. It's but money, I, money over life. It's money over life. Once Mark realised Takata was serious about using ammonium nitrate, he immediately told his superior, Hideo Nakajima, of his concerns. I told him that this was hazardous, um, and I again reiterated the prediction that someone would be killed if we went forward with this. And the response I got was, yes, I will raise the issue, I will elevate this, but don't hold out much hope, the decision's already been made. I left the company shortly thereafter, uh, and they went into production several months after I left. And people have been killed. And people have been killed and maimed. Coming up, how Takata's cover-up unraveled. This is the whistleblowing team. Yes, it is. How does it feel to be in that club? Not good. A company's criminality. Isn't that just basic fraud? Yes. Yes, it is. And the outrageous deceit that caused catastrophe. It was like, what in the world would have cut your face that much? That's next on 60 Minutes. Whistleblower Mark Lilly left his job with Takata Corporation in 2000, after he gave up trying to get someone to listen. He knew their decision to use ammonium nitrate would end up in tragedy, with airbags exploding in front of drivers. But what he didn't realise was that two other employees, Dan Ramon and Tom Sheridan, shared his concerns. Both men were also making dire warnings to Takata executives. 20 years on, the three whistleblowers are meeting together for the very first time. So gentlemen, we're overlooking just one city right here. How many Takata airbags do you think are down there? Well, there's probably half a million cars, so about 100,000 Takata airbags. These men of good conscience have a mission, to help draw attention to this massive problem. For Dan and Tom, it's the first time they've ever spoken to the media. I thought I did all I could do back then to bring this problem up. I think what I can do right now is try to make everybody aware of the problem. This is the whistleblowing team. Yes, it is. How does it feel to be in that club? Not good. We wish that we didn't have to be here. The men worked at two different Takata facilities in the US, and they've brought proof to the meeting of the crimes they witnessed. Takata individually didn't listen to any one of you? No. No. As a manufacturing engineer, Tom realised safety data was being doctored. He wrote a damning report that was ignored by all senior executives. In it, he proved Takata management had manipulated test data. So if an airbag inflator failed, they would change it to a pass for the quality report. Just to sum it up quickly, what I found was is there was some inflators that, uh, that came apart during the deployments. But what they did was is they used inflators 
from some other type of testing and they use that data to fulfill the missing data points in the qualification test report. Are you saying they replace the defective parts with other components? That's correct. In order to fudge the figures for yeah. their customers? Yes. Dan worked on the factory floor, overseeing eight production lines, making 10,000 airbags a day. He too noticed the defect reports were being tampered with. Dan, you're giving them one set of figures and they're producing another. Isn't that just basic fraud? Yes. Yes, it is. And this is what we were reporting every day. Dan also started wondering why the overflowing rejection piles in the factory had started to diminish in size. He eventually found out the answer and was astounded. You're getting all these rejects. What happens then? Quality folks come out and look at them. No alarm. OK, yeah, why don't you go ahead and input those in and just change them back from fail to pass. Correct me if I'm wrong here. You're telling me they invented ways of introducing rejected airbag parts. That's correct back onto the production yes. line. This was nothing new to them. Sadly, each whistleblower failed to wake Takata management up and get some action from them. How did you explain to yourself that earth-shattering silence? After a few weeks, I, I just came to the conclusion that they had to already know. I don't know why you would continue to make a product that's defective and put it out to the public, knowing that they're going to come apart. As the years passed, tens of millions of Takata airbags were built into the world's cars, just waiting to go off. But it took nine years before their time was up. 18-year-old Ashley Parham was the first fatality in 2009. After that, there were more and more deaths. That's where the metal traveled up, right here, and then went all the way up, lodged in the eyeball there. Corey Burdick considers himself a lucky man after he survived a Takata airbag explosion more than four years ago. Still a scar, so. He lost his right eye in the accident, which, just like all the others, was a minor collision in his Honda Civic. How fast do you reckon you were going? Five miles an hour, maybe. That all? That, yeah, I was just trying to go through the stop sign there. Do you remember yeah. the, the moment it exploded? No, I don't really remember it, ex it exploded. I just remember hearing the bang. Oh, what the heck was that, you know? It's like, whoa. <laughs> you get out of the car and you see blood going everywhere. Corey's wife, Kaylee, could barely recognize her own husband when she rushed to the scene. It looked like something you would see out of a movie. I, I did not know if his eyeball was there or not. I was like, what in the world would have cut your face, you know, that much? The Burdicks only found out the true reason for his injury days later, when hospital staff showed them the large piece of metal shard they'd extracted from his skull. When they pulled out that three inch piece of metal and he said, this came from an airbag, it's a defect. And I was like, wow, well, why was it defective, you know? If it hadn't been for the airbag, you would have walked away easily. Absolutely, with no injuries, yeah. One, fire. As more people died, the Takata cover-up was beginning to unravel. Mr. Shimazu, how many people would need to die before you'd be willing to do a nationwide recall? By the time the US congressional hearings into Takata deaths began, in November 2014, seven people had already died. Shrapnel from my car's airbag shot through the airbag cloth and embedded into my right eye and cheek. I was instantly blinded on my right side. I asked the committee to do everything in its power to make sure every vehicle with the defective airbags is made safe. Another two people had to die before US safety authorities took control, forcing a compulsory recall in May 2015. Up until now, Takata has refused to acknowledge that their airbags are defective. That changes today. Yet, at the same time, back in Australia, the story could not have been more different. There have been 24 airbag fatalities around the world. This was Australia's first. And the Takata nightmare was about to really explode. It's a tragedy that should never have happened. Yet here we are. 
coming up. Any engineer knows that ammonium nitrate is an explosive. It's never been stabilised. A senseless practice becomes a class action. It's an unbelievable scandal. But why were Aussie drivers left at risk? Why was the ACCC quite literally asleep at the wheel? That's next on 60 Minutes. Right now, there's a million cars with these ticking time bombs just waiting to go off. That means about one in every 16 drivers is at serious risk on our roads. Now, earlier this year, our consumer watchdog legally forced car manufacturers to replace all Takata airbags in cars across Australia. But we were way too slow to act. Back in May 2015, the United States government had forced car makers to replace faulty airbags. But here, we relied on a voluntary recall. Car companies in Australia, though, didn't do a very thorough job. The uptake to fix the problem was low. Meanwhile, there was a tragic cost. In Darwin, a family was destroyed. It was a survivable crash except for the faulty deployment of the airbag. Sorry, Detective Sergeant Mike Audelman is still horrified at the impact an exploding airbag has had on a young woman who was severely injured in April last year. She's been reduced from a young, vibrant lady in her early 20s to now roughly 12 years old. Equivalent Where, mental yes, state. And there, there's some paralysis to parts of her body. It's a horrendous experience for anyone to go through. Yet, ultimately, there had to be a death in Australia to wake our safety regulators up to the Takata nightmare. 52-year-old Hugh Nang No hit in the neck by flying shrapnel. It was a minor accident in Sydney in July last year, but the driver bled to death after shrapnel from his Takata airbag pierced his neck. Finally, the federal government was forced to act. It ordered the consumer watchdog, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, to investigate why the voluntary recall wasn't working. When we got involved in July 2017, we had massive resistance from the manufacturers who told us that it was all OK, uh, that the voluntary recall was, was going well, no problems at all. Rod Sims is the chairman of the ACCC. After investigating, in February this year, it made the voluntary recall compulsory and told car manufacturers they'd face tough penalties if they didn't fix the airbags. So they were dragged kicking and screaming into the recall, even though they knew two and a half years previous their parent bodies had done exactly the same thing, been subject to the same thing in America. I think it's fair to say the manufacturers were dragged kicking and screaming into this recall. Have the manufacturers of the cars who have these in them done enough to fix the potential harm? Well, until now, no, they have not. And I think we'd still be talking in theory and voluntary recalls unless those poor people had uh, suffered those horrible accidents. Lawyer Damien Scatini is taking class actions against the car manufacturers. He can't believe they put ammonium nitrate airbags into their cars in the first place. Any engineer knows that ammonium nitrate is an explosive and it can't be stabilised. It's never been stabilised. And how many engineers do you think there are from Honda, BMW, Toyota, Mazda? And not one of them said, hang on, why are we putting bomb-making material into our uh, vehicles? The umbrella group for Australia's car manufacturers is the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries. The chief executive, Tony Webber, refused to be interviewed, as did eight of the board members we contacted, who just happened to also be senior executives of the major car companies in Australia. Their silence is surprising, considering they're at the centre of the largest motor vehicle recall in history. I think there's been some appalling behaviour where uh, profit has been put ahead of product safety and I think that should be condemned and I hope that corporate Australia 
and corporates worldwide learn lessons out of this so that we don't have a repeat of this. Rod Sims' anger genuine, is genuine, but there are also questions over why his ACCC didn't intervene sooner. Remember, it had the power to make the compulsory recall happen. And it also knew the Americans had acted back in 2015. Instead, the ACCC says the Australian recall actually wasn't its responsibility, that it was really the concern of another government safety regulator, the Department of Infrastructure. The US government forced car makers into a compulsory recall two and a half years before you acted in the same way. Why was the ACCC quite literally asleep at the wheel? The ACCC got involved in July 2017. Uh, motor vehicle recalls are handled by the Department of Infrastructure, just like food industry recalls are handled by Food uh, Standards Australia. You knew American drivers were being protected, and yet you didn't move to protect Australian drivers in the same way for two and a half years. The recalls are done by the Department of Infrastructure. They're not done by us, so... Well, that was the voluntary recall, but under the ACL, the Australian Consumer Law Act, yes. you have the power to mandate the compulsory recall. But the Department of Infrastructure was in charge of this issue. Unfortunately, it did take the death of Mr No in uh, July 2017. Then ministers stepped in and asked the ACCC to get involved. But and hang, we hang took on, it over hang. from July 2017. But 60 Minutes knows that as far back as 2015, the Department of Infrastructure was talking with the ACCC about how to match the US action because car makers here weren't doing enough under the voluntary recall. The department sought the ACCC's help because the consumer watchdog had more legal power to act. The ACCC describes these as low-level discussions involving junior officials. But whatever the seniority, these officials were very concerned about the safety of Australian drivers. In this email, we can reveal that a department official wrote to the ACCC. On the one hand, we have the biggest ever worldwide vehicle recall. Massive fines in the US, eight deaths, many injuries. On the other, we have no known incidents in Australia. We really don't understand why this should be the case. Are we just lucky so far? Despite the warnings, it appears that their fears were not escalated up to Mr Sims. The only discussions I'm aware of was where our people at the ACCC were asked by the Department of Infrastructure to come to some meetings because we control uh, the safety recall website. In the end, the Department of Infrastructure never formally asked the ACCC to step in, but the ACCC also didn't act and didn't use its power to move to a compulsory recall until after the July 2017 death of Mr Nyo. Whatever the delineation between the two safety regulators, the system appears to have failed. It will now be up to the coroner to examine if action should have been taken sooner. So every year, month and week that went by, it was more likely that this would happen, inevitable that this would happen. It was always going to happen it here was in Australia. Going to happen. And our motorists are just allowed to uh, to play Russian rule. Drive around in ignorance with um, with you know these aging time bombs in their uh, in the front of their vehicle. You've had a mandatory recall here in the states for years before before our mandatory recall was brought in. Yes. For exactly the same vehicle, for the same age vehicle, for the same age airbags. C can you understand how that can happen? That that is totally inappropriate, and obviously the Australian authorities had to be aware of what was happening in the States. Former Takata chemical engineer Mark Lilly says the nightmare is far from over. Right now, most car makers are replacing the deadly Takata airbags with newer Takata airbags that still use the dangerous ammonium nitrate. The only difference is that the new ones contain a desiccant. 
the desiccant will take up moisture until it's saturated, after which it is of no use at all. They're not fixing it, and they know they're not fixing it. They're postponing it. So it means the replacement airbag will itself have to be replaced in six years' time. You certainly should take your airbag in for the replacement. You'll get a newer version that is less likely to fail, but if you think that solved the problem, you're fooling yourself. In the US, justice has caught up with Takata. Mark Lilly's former boss, Hideo Nakajima, was one of three company executives that have been charged with concealing information about faulty airbags. It's an unbelievable scandal. It, it, how we got to this position will one day be a study in corporate misbehaviour. At the highest level. At the highest level. Finally, the Takata whistleblowers feel like their voices are being heard, but they're frustrated that it's all too late. You ask yourself the question, could we have done more? When you, when, you're, when you get to the point where you start beating your head against the wall, and you get no response, and, and nobody's responding. You, you have done everything you think you know how to do, but at the end of the day, there's still all those what ifs. What else could I have done? And that's what you gotta live with. Every time I see another report of a fatality or a serious injury, um, yeah, I have trouble sleeping that night. The, the story just seems to get worse, doesn't it? It just, it, the nightmare continues, if I can put it that way. Yes, it does, and I think the public is not fully aware of how grave the danger is. Where do you think it ranks in terms of scandals? In the automotive industry, I believe it's the largest scandal we've ever seen. If you want to check if your car is affected by the Takata airbag recall, go to ismyairbagsafe.com.au and enter your number plate and state or territory. Or you can go to the productsafety.gov.au site and click on the Takata airbag recall link for a full list of affected cars. Hello, I'm Liam Bartlett. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.